EIT Food is Europe's leading food innovation initiative, working to make the food system more sustainable, healthy and trusted by consumers. EIT Food is building a unique network of diverse partners that provide a holistic view of the food value chain, including key industry players, agri-food startups, research centres and universities from across Europe, all working together to deliver an innovative and entrepreneurial food sector. Packaging is a 900 billion euro industry and an integral and important part of the global economy. It not only delivers direct economic benefits, but can also contribute to increased levels of resource productivity by increasing food shelf life and protecting it during transportation. However, the packaging industry also affects our Earth in a negative way, polluting our soil, air and oceans. The packaging today has um, moved in a way to, from being this uh, fantastic uh, enabler to reaching uh, people, the products to people, to having some uh, negative aspects uh, related to it. We can't just take away packaging because that will cause more food waste and product waste, which will burden our environment even more than the package do. In 2016, Europe inhabitants produced a total of 86.7 million tonnes of packaging waste. That's the combined weight of almost 350,000 of the world's largest airplanes. Of these 86.7 million tonnes of packaging waste, most of it is paper and cardboard. Plastic and glass together make up 19%, 16% is wood, and 5% is metal packaging waste. At the moment, a large part of this waste is not recycled, especially when we look at plastics. A staggering 58% of waste plastic is not recycled. Other materials, such as metal and paper, do better. Almost 75% of these materials are recycled. These numbers don't look that bad, but European countries ramp their recycling numbers up by burning it in ovens to generate electricity and heating, so-called energy recovery or by loading it onto container ships to be sent to Asia for recycling. Here, the waste is often burned or abandoned, eventually finding its way into rivers and oceans. Out of sight, out of mind. Let's take a look at what happens with plastic waste, since this is the biggest polluter. Of the almost 80 million tonnes of plastic waste we produce, 40% ends up in landfills, about a third leaks away, and the rest is used for incineration. Only 14% is actually collected for recycling. Of the 14% packaging waste that is collected for recycling, over 4% gets either lost in the process and 8% is a form of cascaded recycling. On average, this leaves us with only 2% of the total amount of plastic packaging waste that is truly recycled. This is not only devastating for the health of our Earth, but also a terrible waste of money. The ideal picture of a sustainable packaging value chain is when packaging can be regenerative and when we can contribute in a regenerative way to our circular economy. And I think one of the things that we could do with, and, and how we envision a future where packaging is serving mostly as an enabler to really you know, convey whatever is inside is where that waste is managed in a way that can be a resource and can be used back into the economy. When material, such as packaging material, has a value that means it will not end up in nature where it doesn't belong. It stays in a loop. Uh, packaging material will not necessarily only be used for packaging. It can be first packaging material for food and then it can be used for something else. For example, a spare part in a car or as a furniture piece. We need circular systems. We need to packaging to be recycled and go back into the streams again, not out to the oceans and out in the streets as waste. What if we could live in a world with clean oceans, clean air and clean soil? A world without waste, because waste doesn't exist anymore. All used materials are seen as valuable and they re-enter the economy loop as technical or biological nutrients, because they can be reused or recycled in a closed loop. In this way, a circular economy is created that drastically reduces the leakage of packaging into natural systems and by decoupling raw materials from fossil feedstocks. To move beyond small-scale and incremental improvements and to achieve the systemic shift towards a new circular packaging economy, EIT Food as an independent coordinating vehicle should drive this collaborativity across industry, cities, governments, NGOs, startups and media.
We need to make our uh, uh, packaging material sustainable and uh, there are two, two parts of it. One is to use uh, renewable feedstock and then the other one is to, to, to create a circularity uh, and uh, by that also to reuse as much as possible, uh, creating a closed loop. I think we also have to take into consideration the three R's, so redu reduce, reuse, recycle, so there can be combinations of this. We can have a package that is uh, reusable, maybe it's a secondary package. We can have recyclable and compostable packages on the inside. So we have to think in different opportunities that often do not exist in the world we have today. The ideal picture would be that we have zero waste, meaning also zero packaging waste. Material will be treated as a currency, which means no material will end up in nature and that we can identify all the side streams because there's a lot of unidentified side streams today that needs to be identified and could have a, a buyer. So that means that basically we have to redefine or redesign our packaging materials to be ready to recycle. And that ready to recycle is at the moment a very important topic in Puratus. We have to modify the existing concepts or at least innovate with new concepts to make it completely recyclable already ready to recycle. That can go from very basic principles, for example, that you don't have to stick, um, just as an example, a paper label onto a plastic packaging, which could not be detached later on. That's a very important one. And so it's better to, for example, produce a plastic label that you put on a plastic pack as mono material and then recycle the whole concept. I believe the ideal picture of the world um, would be that in which packaging enhances the product inside delivers it in a way that is safe, that can be transported to many people around the world and is preserving the uniqueness of whatever it's packaging without having an environmental footprint or minimizing as much as possible the environmental footprint. Meaning not only on the end of life and the waste, but the way in which it's sourced, the way in which it's produced, uh, the way in which it's uh, managing other resources like water or uh, the ingredients it uses. So really it's about you know, enhancing the goodness that packaging is bringing without the negative uh, or managing as best as possible the, the negative aspects that packaging has today. Into sustainable development, there are so much things to do at the moment that we just cannot put it beside us. It's becoming so important that new projects have to be started, new developments have to be made to follow the demand of the market. And we will come to a certain point where certain types of material, certain types of packaging concepts will not longer accept it anymore. So we really have to work in it. By 2030, Europe wants a smart, innovative and sustainable plastics industry where design and production fully respects the needs of reuse, repair and recycling, brings growth and jobs to Europe and helps cut the EU's greenhouse gas emissions and our dependence on imported fossil fuels. The objective will be to ensure that by 2030, all plastic packaging in the EU market is reusable or easily recyclable. But there are some barriers that have to be overcome. One main barrier is the lack of collaboration because we need to collaborate along the whole supply chain of food and packaging and also with recyclers. So that is one barrier. In my opinion, um, we are still working too much in silos between the different, let's say, value actors um, into the food chain. Um, the food, business food companies um, are developing materials, are developing uh, new products, uh, but at the moment don't think enough later on what will happen with their empty packaging. And the same is happening, for example, for the collectors and for the recyclers. They're recycling and they're trying to make business out of it. And the same for the conversers, turning these, let's say, recycled grains back into um, new materials for the food or the non-food business. These things are still happening too differentiated. We should integrate, let's say, all the actors um, into one chain and try to take the value out of it and, and try to generate value for all the actors in the chain. We need a, a full systems change. And this requires many parts to be doing and contributing in a positive way, but also the coordination of all those parts. And when you move one of those parts in the system, it affects the others. So the biggest barrier that I see is really in the coordination. Another barrier might be governmental in terms of taking too quick decisions without thinking about the consequences of decisions in terms of um, packaging material, plastics, because some decisions might lead to more product waste if you don't consider them properly. Um, other barriers are 
lack of knowledge among consumers and also media and journalists who tend to write about m problems and not about the value of packaging that is, it really has to protect food and protect it from being wasted. When we talk about food waste, which is a very important topic nowadays, uh, let's say an adaptation of your packaging or packaging concept might not um, increase your food waste. So we have to find uh, new solutions which protect the product, are efficient uh, in production and protect uh, our environment as much as possible. Packaging is most easily recycled when it consists of only one material. So developers of new packaging solutions face one big problem. How to create the perfect monomaterial for packaging. If you reduce, you can never be 100% sure what, what it contains. Uh, the recycled materials, they could have contaminations and you need to make sure that these contaminations are, uh, uh, never reaches uh, uh, the food. Uh, uh, so uh, one, one part of this is to have uh, barriers in, in, in the packaging material, functional barriers, migration barriers that make sure that substances uh, in recycled content that should not be in contact with food never will be. The cardboard provides rigidity and uh, robustness to the packaging and the alufoil contributes to the, most of the barriers that are needed like oxygen barrier and, and light barrier and so on. And then the, uh, the polyethylene is needed uh, for sealing the package and uh, also to protect the outside from moisture, for instance. So uh, all the, the different materials, of course, have their specific uh, role in the packaging uh, laminate. You need to have a barrier. In many cases, you need to have a printing. So there are always some additives to, to the material. And uh, there we have to find uh, the best trade-off between uh, a pure uh, recycling stream and the additives that are necessary to ensure the product protection and uh, also well, marketing and uh, consumer requirements what the package should look like. So one challenge is then of course to uh, uh, create the same combined functionality in the packaging material but uh, with uh, materials that are uh, contributing even less to carbon footprint and that are even easier to recycle. You could go to monomaterials, which would be easy to recycle, but that would mean to achieve the same barrier as you are used to right now for the shelf life you are used to, uh, the materials would get much thicker. That means for plastic packaging, more plastic. Um, and on the other side, uh, there are um, trials to get to barriers which are very thin coatings but very dense, which could be placed on plastic as well as on paper material, which do not impact in the recycling stream. Uh, but these have to be developed right now. So we are in the beginning of a journey. Uh, and this is true for uh, the whole sustainable packaging discussion. We are at the beginning of a journey which goes stepwise to better and finally to 100% recyclable, um, bio-based or 100% compostable packages. But we have steps in between, getting to smaller barriers, to different type of barriers, to coatings. Um, we will not have that right from the beginning, right now, tomorrow. There are two ways to incentivize companies, either through a tax, <laughs> you know, a, a big tax examine if you're not 100% recyclable. Okay, we need to move. Or through a positive incentive. You pay less, less fees of waste management if you're increasing your use of recycled material. And to today, there are a lot of moves, I think, on the latter, but not enough to actually price or give incentives to companies and brands that are doing what's right. And so I think that we need more and more to actually not only collaborate with as an industry and with companies and with startups to scale, but we need the, the government also to price and to say, you're a good company that's doing what's right. This is the incentive you get for doing what's right. And not only this is the tax you're going to have to pay so that the system works, but we need the right incentives, all of us along the chain to actually be able to scale the solutions. This is uh, important to have security in the market, to invest in new solutions. 
And also, um, we have seen it in the light bulb business where uh, a ban of one solution can quickly lead to a lot of innovation uh, that is more beneficial both to the consumers and to the whole industry. Companies like Bosch are always innovating. With the support of EIT Food, they have now developed a paper packaging with a minimum of polymers. The project is called In Paper. So this is our machine uh, that produces shaped paper pots, as we call it. It's a three-dimensional forming of paper. And uh, as you can see here, we are able from a reel of material that starts here at the beginning to form a pot, to fill the pot, to seal the pot, and uh, to cut out nice shapes. So what we have here is a paper on the outside, uh, which is roughly about 80 to 85 percent. We still have a polymer layer that we usually require for product protection and for sealing integrity. But we constantly work on improving the uh, ratio of uh, paper to polymer in the packaging. So reduce as much as possible, but this is an ongoing process where we want to step by step come to less environmental harmful solutions and increase the environmental friendliness of the packaging. We are on a, on a journey. We have started initiatives in, internally. We want to uh, make our packaging technology and packaging machines in a way that they are flexible to handle very different kinds of materials that are coming up now and will come up uh, in the future. So uh, machinability of the materials in a robust process is very important. So this enables our customers, brand owners and retailers uh, to produce in an efficient and optimized uh, way. We are going to thinner plastic materials where plastic can't be replaced. We are going to alternative materials, which is uh, paper, for example, and we have this EIT uh, food funded uh, in paper project for, for uh, developing new solutions on that. We are going to um, mono materials instead of multi layers uh, and improving our machinery for that. Uh, we are looking for alternative package uh, shapes and forms uh, which are, um, have a lower impact um, in the environment. And the fifth is we are going to be uh, more sustainable on ourselves. So our machines should consume less um, and uh, our, uh, the media consumption and the electrical power consumption should be lower than we have it right now. Many brand owners are looking for alternatives to the packaging they have today, but often they have to make compromises and we want to minimize the risk for them to switch to new and more sustainable packaging. So the innovation about shaped paper pots is both in the material and in the process. So the material has a higher stretchability compared to standard materials and in the process we are aiming at increasing the depth of the cavities that we can form. And this is the tricky part because the deeper you go uh, the more difficult it uh, becomes because paper is much different than uh, polymer solutions. Bosch developed this new kind of packaging for the fresh products and cookies industry. So this is the tool that we have uh, developed for the cookie trays and we are able to shape this as it is uh, here. You can see the mold, so this is the lower part of the tool. Now in a second step we, ha step we have optimized the tool to improve uh, the design of the shape and to improve the stiffness uh, of the tray. One material that I personally believe is very future-oriented is, uh, is paper and there are a lot of uh, innovations going on in the paper industry and the advantage of paper is that it's already bio-based, biodegradable, it's produced in uh, large quantities, it's recycled in many areas of the world and it's very easy for consumers to understand because they already know it's a natural product. And if we take paper as a base material and add functional polymers or other materials uh, to it, we can come to packagings uh, that are much more sustainable than what we have today. So from the consumer perspective, paper-based packaging is easier to understand. It's mainly of paper, you can throw it in the paper bin 
usually the paper recyclers can handle a certain amount of uh, plastics in their recycling facilities and ensures that uh, the paper content of this packaging gets recycled. I guess we will see uh, good paper barriers, not be which are not the traditional plastic films, not before 2022-23. So there's a good piece of development now to be, to be done. Uh, so it's an open journey. I can't tell you right now when we are there. So help on innovation is welcome because Europe wants to get the recycling rate of all fractions up to 100% by 2030. The most fresh and innovative ideas may come from the younger generations. University students and their professors could play a major role in the innovation of new packaging solutions. We are taking the system's perspective. We are looking not only into one actor, we are looking to the whole system. We are making analysis of decisions. What does it mean if you make a decision to food waste, to environment? The research is about designing for a sustainable future more or less and we do research and we teach and we try also to make both students and researchers being creative and innovative. We love when it comes out new solutions that we can push away to companies. <laughs> we should involve the academic uh, world, uh, universities, uh, high schools coming in with their knowledge with let's say the young people who are motivated in, in, in packaging and also invite them into companies for example to make um, their thesis, to make their, their um, their work into companies as well to understand really what the company needs and, and where we are going to in terms of packaging. EIT Food aims to play a major role in stimulating innovation projects, not only from their industry partners but also from students and startups, and is therefore supporting companies and universities in their collaboration. We have EIT Food uh, funded project uh, on training, on education. Uh, called EcoPack with uh, some universities uh, to promote um, sustainability and sustainable packaging knowledge um, into students uh, studying uh, food sciences and food technologies. So this is also something which uh, where we try to get uh, the information to the consumer via the students, via the uh, universities. We can be the objective partner that can put stakeholders together and say, hey, we have a common problem here. We have to f waste less food. So how can we approach that together? And that is taking things beyond because we need new business model in the value chain. Who should take the costs for, for doing this? And there we can be an objective part. All new research then we can feed into students because that's the next generation of packaging developers. So that is kind of always pushing the system. That's our role. That's our main task, I think. Cities are important so-called living labs, where new concepts can be implemented and tested in a real setting. Leuven, a cosy student city near Brussels, has the vision to become 100% circular and a zero-waste city by 2050. Therefore, a strategic agenda has to be set up. Leuven's roadmap to 2050 and all major stakeholders are being brought together to make this happen. Huge efforts will be made on mobility. Houses will be isolated so that energy use is scaled back to the lowest possible level. But the city wants to do more. Aanvankelijk hebben we vooral gefocust op die gebouwen en op die mobiliteit. Daar is al heel wat rond gebeurd, maar daar gaan we nog veel meer rond moeten doen. Maar nu komen inderdaad andere aspecten van dat klimaatneutrale verhaal naar boven. En dan gaat het bijvoorbeeld over voeding en landbouw. Zorg je dat mensen op een andere manier beginnen te consumeren in deze stad. Zorg je ook dat er korte ketens ontstaan tussen voedselproducenten aan de ene kant en consumenten aan de andere kant. We hebben bijvoorbeeld rond de parkabdij hier in Leuven hebben we een, een nieuwe generatie landbouwbedrijf, dat heet Boer Company. Dat zijn jonge uh, boeren, men noemt dat Community Supported Agriculture. En die idee is, ja, je kan dat ook een zelfoogstboerderij noemen, die idee is dat inwoners van Leuven uh, aansluiten bij die zelfoogstboerderij en daar inderdaad zelf groenten gaan oogsten, zelf gaan meewerken op die boerderij. En dat gebeurt op vrij grote schaal. Honderden gezinnen van Leuven gaan daar wekelijks naartoe om daar, om daar mee te helpen en dus zelf te gaan oogsten. Dat is een heel mooi concreet voorbeeld van hoe dat het kan. 
En een van de gevolgen is natuurlijk dat je voedselproductie hebt waar geen afval mee gepaard gaat. Hè? Want die, die producten zijn niet verpakt, die komen rechtstreeks van het veld. Dus dat is een, een heel mooi voorbeeld. Maar wij willen ons niet beperken tot Leuven. Er zijn ook uh, organisaties hier die bezig zijn met het project Kortom Leuven. En de bedoeling daarvan is om een soort business-to-business uh, distributieplatform te krijgen voor landbouw producten uit de brede regio. Dus dat gaat over een straal van ongeveer 40 kilometer rond Leuven. Dan gaan we in kaart brengen uh, welke zijn interessante landbouwbedrijven die uh, interesse hebben in rechtstreekse afname. En we kijken hier in de stad welke organisaties, handelszaken, bedrijven hebben interesse om die producten af te nemen. En als we die twee bij elkaar kunnen brengen, wel dan hebben we alweer hetzelfde, namelijk rechtstreekse afname van voedselproducten zonder dat er een supermarkt tussen hoeft te zitten en dus zonder dat heel de verpakkingsindustrie eraan te pas komt. Dat circulaire verhaal, dat is eigenlijk iets waar dat je ook heel wat mensen uit de bedrijfswereld, uit de academische wereld rond aan het werk kunt zetten. En de grote uitdaging gaat erin bestaan om al die projecten te gaan opschalen, zodat ze effectief een verschil maken op het niveau van een stad met 150.000 inwoners. Wat vind ik van afval? Dat er te veel is. <laughs> te veel afval, hè? In ieder geval afval waar we niks meer, meer kunnen, hè? Thuis scheiden we altijd afval. En ik probeer het ook altijd als uh, verpakking wordt gecombineerd, papier en plastic samen, om het dan toch uit elkaar te halen. Ik ben in de winkels en zo met recyclen en zo, daar ben ik niet echt uh, heel bewust mee bezig. Maar uh, zoals ik al zei, ik vind het wel goed dat mensen er wel gewoon mee bezig zijn en het, uh, en het doen. I'm just, uh, I don't know, I like buying things and, uh, but I'm trying to do my best uh, in my quotidianity to use as less plastic as I can. But yeah, if I have to think when I buy stuff, I never think to the amount of plastic, uh, etc. I do recycle. Uh, I. I have everything in my house separated, so I know where all the trash needs to go. I avoid buying pre-cut vegetables or fruits because I know like, if I start doing it, I won't stop doing it in the future because people get lazy. So I don't even start. <laughs> Zij, ja, uh, ik ben fanatieker. Jij, jij bent fanatieker. Ja. Denise is wel een stuk fanatieker daarin, maar uh, ik koop wel eens een keer een zakje omdat ik er gewoon van tevoren niet bewust mee bezig ben dat ik hem moet meenemen, maar ik probeer het er wel aan te denken dat ik gewoon mijn eigen tas meeneem. En ik ga dan ook liever met tien spullen in mijn handen naar huis lopen, omdat ik denk, dan geen plastic. <laughs> ik probeer daarnaar te kijken, maar soms kun je er haast niet omheen. Dan, dan zit het zo verpakt als we nou bijvoorbeeld een, een biologische paprika willen hebben, wat een paar weken geleden ook weer bij de issue bij Albert Heijn was, dan zit het nog verpakt in plastic en ze zeggen dat zou zijn ter voorkoming van bacteriële ziektes. <laughs> Bij sommige theezakjes, dan heb je een papieren uh, zakje en daar binnenin zit dan plastic. En dan denk ik, waarom zit daar plastic in? Als, je, als er plastic eromheen doet, dan hou je plastic over. En uh, gelukkig denk ik dat consumenten wat, wat, uh, wat voorzichtiger gaan worden op dit moment. De bewustwording is er wel degelijk, maar je moet wel de mogelijkheid hebben om het zonder plastic te kunnen krijgen. So one thing that the industry could and actually should do is to reduce the amount of packaging that you use in software that the majority of the products is not packaged in a minimalistic way. So they try to increase the, like, the perceived quantity of the food. Um, or by yeah, increasing the packaging, so they basically just waste material to lead to the customer to misbelief that a certain amount of food is in there. And of course this is for marketing purposes, to make it look bigger, however they don't have an incentive to change it, so this is also a policy topic, you know, if on a, on a policy level, on the, Euro the European Union also national level, this would be forbidden, then there is a push factor for the industry to actually adopt to this, and this is always about incentivization at the end. So this is an interplay also of policymakers, industry and the consumers that is key here. I think the industry is just offering too many products of the same thing like shampoos and everything and then they have like different scents but in the end you don't really, you don't necessarily need that many choices. In my point of view I think the industry is like doing enough because every time I go to shopping or buy something at a store Um, I can see more and more packaging become like the paper made, not instead of plastic. 
So I think that's a good point. And also, I see all the when I buy a Coke from the McDonald's or something, the straw became pa the paper. So it's, I think the industry is doing something, but it's not enough. Maybe they should do more. I think wel dat het uh, bedrijf maakt het zichzelf zo voordelig mogelijk en uh, als je geen belangen en uh, ja duurzaamheid denk ik. Juist. En, of je uh, moet er bewust voor kiezen als bedrijf denk ik. Als je ja, dat juist wil ja, uitstralen ja. als duurzaam bedrijf, dan doen ze dat wel. Maar, maar ik denk dat het, uh, het laat ik zeggen, de makkelijkste, voordeligste optie is om, om er niet te veel mee bezig te zijn en uh, dan uh, ja, krijg je eigenlijk die uh, extra waste en uh, dat is niet goed. Texas probably not a sustainable incentive because maybe they can work around this. You know? So really setting up strict laws just that prohibit this, but then of course it's also a lobbying issue, right? So the industry has quite some power in preventing those laws to be passed. And then the big question is how can we work around that? And I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. Maar het jammer is dat die plastic zo lang in het milieu blijft. Hè? Op vele generaties lang blijft dat rondzwerven, een hele kleine deeltjes. En daar moeten de grote industrieën, zoals bijvoorbeeld Unilever, die veel met voeding te maken heeft, Nestlé, zullen daar iets aan moeten gaan doen. En niet morgen, nee nu. Many consumers are already very conscious about sustainability and sustainable packaging. But uh, for those who are not, and the majority uh, has definitely other uh, issues, for them it should be easy on how do you handle the package, how do you handle the material, where do you, uh, uh, in which bin do you throw it, uh, what do you do with it. Uh, so for them, I think uh, convenience is most important. Today, you know, there is there is on one end attention and consumers more and more are wanting to do something for the planet live more sustainably consume more responsibly so on one end is yes i want to live sustainably i want to do more for the planet for the environment for my health but i don't want to you know reduce my convenience i don't want to carry a reusable uh tote bag to the supermarket so it's very difficult for brands to actually bring things to consumers if we don't see that there is really a switch in, in, in behavior. The ideal infrastructure would be that the consumer doesn't have to think what it should do with the packaging. They should just put it in one place and they don't have to think about anything else. I don't want to see in my vision to have uh, environmental impact on, on products I'm buying in the shop. What means first I need a choice of products which are uh, obviously clear how to handle them also to bring them back into a recycling system. And uh, I would love to see a recycling, which is not downcycling, but keeping the level. So uh, that means uh, we need uh, a very uh, clearly defined recycling streams and we need the consumer who knows how to use them and a recycling system, which is very easy to understand for everybody. So we need a lot of training for this, but uh, I guess we can feed the world even in 20 or 50 years or 100 years uh, if we follow this path and uh, come to more sustainable products. Companies and organizations that say they want to change the packaging world should practice what they preach. Danone we think that the changes starts with the small things. That's your standard vending machine, which would give you a plastic bottle that will contain some water, right? But we are thinking more and more that the future would be containing other solutions and you can have your bigger jar with water and just refill it. And once you refill it, you still have water. And if you're still using the uh, plastic bottles, right? So your, your plastic bottle can be recycled. And we do partner with a, a startup called Lemon Tree, which has this nice machine, which allows you to Recycle the bottle, and you still do another good action by collecting our caps for the charities. We have innovation, but at some point, I think what we need to drive is a scale. The scale at the speed in which we need that innovation to be put out in the market. At, and and at, not only at a feasibility point of view, but commercially viable for companies and brands to be able to adopt it. So I don't know exactly what the solution for that is, but for sure I see this kind of missing middle gap 
where we have a lot of people that are disrupting, innovative, and we're trialing it at Danone, but at the moment we try to really scale that in our geographies, through our brands, uh, it, that's where I think we get a bit um, stuck. And part of the system, let's say the beginning, the, the production, is not understanding what happens in the end of life or what will happen in the future. And anticipating that future, then whatever we design today for the future might be relevant. To make a simple example, if you have a paper uh, which is made from recycled fibers that may look like gray. Uh, you can add uh, uh, white color pigments or you can bleach it, but uh, the perfect situation from a recycling standpoint would be it uh, looks like gray paper. In the retail you can't sell these packages, so you have to uh, put a message for the consumer on this, a brand message. Uh, and you have to do, put all this information on that. And uh, this is um, nutrition facts, things like that. And uh, this does not work on a, on a bad contrast uh, gray paper. So there are, they have to discuss, each, uh, to discuss and find a compromise. So they have to cooperate. And the same applies to plastics. Uh, there are some nice plastics, retail loves them. You can buy them right now, uh, cheese packages with with a plastic material which has a, the, the haptics like paper or like uh, waxed, uh, waxed paper, but they are from the recycling standpoint or from the, from the idea of uh, bio-based, they are far away from that. So again, they have not discussed with each other. So this is something uh, from my point of view which has to change, we have to cooperate. The next steps for EIT food in this process are when you design new packaging, why don't involve recycling companies from the very beginning? Uh, why don't involve consumers in that uh, for the user friendliness? Why, why don't work together? But, but the most important step is to bring in the recyclers in the early development because that's where we have the big gap. We need the raw material producers, we need the converters, we need the brand owners, we need the retailers. We need the recyclers. Everyone in the value chain needs to collaborate and have a dialogue with each other and actually start working together and have an understanding of each other's processes and challenges. The more that we start to speak to each other and the more that you know, not only companies, but people in the government, consumers, are first and foremost aware about what's happening, aware of their own responsibility and engaged to be part of the solution, the simpler it will be to actually coordinate that solution. So it all starts also with a basic level of understanding, which in many, in many occasions we don't have. In terms of supply chain, we have to break silos. That's clear. Um, the different vectors in the packaging chain are working too much differentiated at the moment. Yeah? So we are doing, let's say, our job. Um, the collectors and the recyclers are doing their job and putting these things back in the market. Uh, for suitable applications. I think we can do much and much better than, than what we are doing today. So breaking silos, um, starting projects, starting, let's say, collaborations with the different actors, that is really key. And there, I think that EIT Food is the perfect platform to run such projects, absolutely. The EIT Food Network um, gives many perspectives from different areas of the supply chain. This could be even more increased uh, to tackle these issues. But uh, for us, it's also important to reduce the risk because this is not uh, a risk that we can take alone. This is a risk uh, that we have to tackle along the value chain and with uh, support of EIT. And uh, then we can come uh, to uh, solutions and innovations that really make a step forward because uh, we can take risk we wouldn't take uh, without EIT and without the partners that we have in the network. EIT Food shall establish a systemic approach and a roadmap for the upcoming seven years and coordinate large-scale pilots and demonstration projects. I think that EIT Food has the main stakeholders there already, but I think there are some missing, like NGOs, for example, consumer organizations, if you want to know about consumers, uh, the labeling organizations for, for eco-labeling, for example, I think they can contribute. Governmental bodies, the decision makers, the ones who make the policies, uh, are they there? I think they could add and they need to be there to get some objective knowledge about this field as well, I guess. Then journalists, 
because they write a lot about this and they make consumer opinions. EIT Food will have to engage policymakers in the development of a common vision of a more effective system. I guess that uh, the um, uh, EIT Food Network has to get more partners from industrial partners from this side. We have very good inputs from the, from the universities on, on new ideas, but uh, this is something which has to match with industrial uh, experience and, and uh, production capabilities. To reach the Agenda 2030 targets, there's policies that need to be changed and we need to have some new uh, regulations. For example, now we see this uh, ban on single-use plastics, but there's a lot of other initiatives that need to be taken as well, and not only based on populist decisions. When it goes too fast with decisions saying that we should ban all plastics, you, you can hear that from certain retailers. We are a little concerned that, as researchers that that will lead to more food waste. And food uh, takes more environmental uh, burden to produce, being produced, than packaging. It makes no sense at all that you have a perfect sustainable packaging right now, which is now our focus, but um, you have also to have a sustainable production of the food. So the, the story for the consumer is not you buy a sustainable packaging, but you buy a product which is sustainable, which includes a sustainable packaging. The producers of the material and the brand owners, they also need to take their responsibility, of course, uh, to make sure that they design products in a material that can be recycled. And then, of course, we need to have the infrastructure so we can recycle those materials as well because recyclable needs to equal recycling. At the end, many companies want to do what's good and consumers want it and are expecting it. And if we don't get organized to actually invest together in these innovations, it's going to be tougher and tougher. Inform consumers, inform authorities, inform people about the value of packaging and the value of saving our food because that the food is also a limited resource on the globe. So we need to be careful with it. Lately there's a lot of uh, talk the talk and I think we all need to walk the talk a bit more. So I'd, lo I'd love to see not only good speeches and, and uh, good ideas, but I'd love to see the impact of those ideas at scale. EIT Food coordinates and drives communication of its vision of the new circular packaging economy. EIT Food as an independent coordinating vehicle should drive this collaborativity across industry, cities, governments, NGOs, startups and media.